and gentlemen, and welcome to this special webinar organized by the CAFU Policy Institute of the Denis and Lenora Forretia Foundation. The CAFU Policy Institute is the think tank of the foundation. And today we are excited to be discussing on this theme, um, preparing for the next pandemic, lessons for COVID-19 for Africa. We are humbled to have um, wonderful panelists, wonderful panelists with us. And Dr. Denise Forretia, who is chairman of the Capital Policy Institute and also the co-chair of the Denise and the Nora Forretia Foundation will be moderating this very wonderful session for us today. Please do use the Q&A box to send in your questions in the course of discussions and the chat box to interact with our panelists and our attendees. Over to you, Dr. Um, thank you very much, Ansel, and welcome to our guests. Thanks for um, a wonderful panel here today. Um, I am very excited to be mod moderating this um, panel discussion on a very, very important topic that um, is dear to all of us. Um, as you all know, the world was caught uh, seriously unprepared uh, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, despite really decades of warnings um, of the threat of global pandemics, um, as well as years of what was international planning. The failure to really adequately fund and respond to um, this, you know, this crisis has really exacted serious um, human and economic toll. Um, as of today, there have been at least 130 million um, COVID cases worldwide. Um, there are close to now 3 million um, people and, and citizens worldwide who have lost their lives to this pandemic. The global economy, as we know, um, contracted severely um, as, as a result of the pandemic, um, except now just um, trying to reopen. Um, the pandemic arguably has been the single uh, 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 greatest international public health emergency in really more than a century. Um, and while we have vaccines now available, um, it is unfortunately, or maybe not surprising that Sub-Saharan Africa uh, remains painfully behind in the race to vaccinate victims. Um, it is um, under this backdrop that we, we are joined here today to start looking at ways in which you know, we have responded worldwide to this pandemic, but more importantly, you know, how we prepare for the next uh, um, pandemic, which is something of an inevitable, uh, which is definitely uh, inevitable. And today we are joined by a um, distinguished um, um, public health expert, uh, Yele Aluko. Um, is, Dr. Yele Aluko is the chief medical officer um, for EY Americas and based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yele is a cardiologist, and um, prior to joining EY Americas, was the senior vice president for Novan Health in, in North Carolina. And um, originally from Nigeria, was um, is a former president of the uh, Association of Nigerian Physicians in the Americas as well. So it's great to have you, Yele. Thank you um, for the invitation. We um, have Dr. Mwenya, Mwenya Kasonde. Dr. Mwenya Kasonde is an emergency medicine physician and global health consultant for various agencies such as the WHO, um, uh, USAID, UNICEF, and other private sector uh, uh, individuals. She was previously the assistant director for global health at the Ministry of um, Public Health in Zambia, but she's currently based somewhere between Geneva and, and Ireland and, and Dublin. So nice to have you, Dr. Kasonde. Thank you, Dennis. Lovely to be here. We have Dr. Ronald Garbina, who is a nephrologist, a great friend, um, and um, nephrologist at the Boya Regional Hospital. Um, currently runs the, the uh, nephrology unit and there, and is, um, as they say in Cameroon, uh, the uh, medical, uh, part of the Conseil Medico or Medical <laughs> you know, at, at the Boya Regional Hospital. Um, he is also the director of the Health Policy and Research Program and CAFU, and also led um, or leads the um, COVID-19 task force. So, uh, Ronald, wonderful having you. Thank you, David. It's my pleasure. And we have, lastly, but certainly not the least, great friend, Dr. Christian uh, uh, Beamer. Dr. Christian Beamer is an associate professor of pulmonary critical care um, at the University of Arizona in Tucson. 
Um, he's also the medical director of the intensive care unit um, uh, 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 at the University of Arizona and has been really at the front line uh, uh, managing COVID patients and driving um, the research and um, publication on COVID response. Christian, welcome. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, let me start with you, Yele. Um, you know, uh, let, let's start just briefly for in, in a couple of minutes. Wh what is your overview as to where we are um, globally, but also the way um, you've seen and evaluated Africa's response to, to the pandemic? Well, thank you for that uh, very important question. So my vantage point is focused globally for the work that I do with a, more of a prioritization of visibility in North America. Uh, but because of my affinity for the continent in general, and Nigeria in particular, I am very keen of the trends and issues that are happening in regards to COVID-19. Now, we very well know that pandemic mitigation strategies have already been established and understood. And these fundamentally depend on level of preparedness, level of readiness, and then executing a response when a pandemic does arise or an epidemic. So within those three verticals, we can assess how an ecosystem, a country or a continent has done. The preparedness of course is predicated on how strong national public health capacities and capabilities and competencies are and how effective are the in-country as well as global surveillance uh, uh, competencies. Um, and the ability to incorporate community engagement and strategic communication. All of those are the foundational elements for preparedness. And as we've seen in the pandemic, the entire world was not prepared. Even countries that had strong public health capabilities. And of course in Africa, Africa was also not prepared. Now we must remember, as we all know, um, uh, Africa is not a, a monolithic uh, environment, We've got 54 countries. So disparate approaches, disparate levels of preparedness with a general level of unpreparedness. However, we do know that there was some degree of readiness based on prior experience with infectious diseases and with previous uh, epidemics on the continent in particular Ebola, also Lassa fever, uh, and HIV. So with little infrastructure, the continent had developed some competencies that enabled some degree of readiness. When we get to the response, the response in Africa, different pockets of better practice, but more, less, less efficient response has been observed. And that is because the, the responses, they, they depend on the ability to identify, track, trace, and then execute on a response. So diagnostic capabilities, contact tracing, the need to have the, the laboratory ingredients, capabilities, reagents, we were slow to mobilize those, but the mobilization did occur. Uh, we do feel that the numbers that have been reported in Africa are likely not to represent the reality. But as we well know, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, the notion that Africa was going to be completely decimated by the pandemic has not come to pass. Yeah. So I'll pause there. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate uh, those comments, in the, the, the building blocks of preparedness, uh, readiness, response. Um, and uh, you know the the underlying uh, systems there, Dr. Moenja. Um, you know, in, in, in if we if we can develop this um, further a little bit, um, and looking at you know we can look at it from the global lens. You know, some opening comments or so, um, but also building on on what Yele has mentioned. Um, 
Um, how have you seen, you know, the way some of the African countries, or if you want to use a, uh, use specific examples, you 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 could. Um, but what has that, you know, um, preparedness response um, uh, readiness uh, um, been from your vantage point, and um, where has it really worked, or where do you see, did you see some um, areas of potential improvement? Thank you so much, Dennis, for this question. And thank you again for organizing this very important discussion. It really is a pleasure to be a part of it. Um, so I've heard it said before, pour penser à l'après-Covid, il faut d'abord penser à l'avant-Covid. That means if you want to speak about how we're going to prepare for the next pandemic, you first have to think about how we were pre prepared indeed before this pandemic came about. This pandemic preparedness really speaks to it, the entire um, health system strengthening, as you know, all the way from service delivery, from healthcare workforce, health information systems, access to essential medicines, including vaccinations, healthcare financing, leadership, and governance. So to answer this specific uh, topic, allow me to focus on two areas in particular, the first being human resources for health, and the second being health information systems. The demand for healthcare services has increased exponentially during this pandemic and will continue to increase. The WHO in fact predicts a shortfall of 18 million healthcare workers in order to meet the 2030 SDGs. And we, as we all know, we have been pushed behind through the pandemic in our attainment towards these sustainable development goals. The UN further recommends the stimulation of at least 40 million jobs in the health and social sector not only to meet the SDGs, but also to achieve universal health coverage and national health goals. Across OECD countries, interestingly, employment in health and social work grew by 48% between the years 2000 and 2014, while jobs in industry and agriculture actually declined. That is to say that the healthcare sector is actually a very interesting and key economic sector, a job generator and a driver of inclusive economic growth. So for me, this goes way beyond the health sector. This goes way, way beyond just COVID-19. In my opinion, the health and social workforce is one of the most important investments that we must make in this century, not just to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and to address future pandemics, but for other reasons outlined previously. And as Dr. Aluko rightly mentioned, Africa has been fighting pandemics for a very long time, from HIV, AIDS, to cholera, to Ebola, et cetera. We're very much used to this. However, our health systems remain fragile. Our economies are dominated by micro-entrepreneurship and the informal employment sector, and as such, will be less able to tolerate even the smallest loss of income. Many of our informal settlements make preventative measures such as social distancing in indeed simply unrealistic. And I explain the benefit of investing in human resources for health through what I call the triple dividend. The first is the healthcare dividend, millions of new jobs created in health and social care will meet a growing demand, respond to demographic changes, and at least assist to deliver universal health coverage, even when faced with a pandemic. The second is the gender equality dividend. 70% of the global health and social workforce is female. Today, women are the main providers of care, including in health emergencies, in humanitarian crises, and in conflict settings. Investment in women and the education of girls to enter formal paid work will increase gender equality and promote women's empowerment as women gain income, education, and autonomy. The third is the development dividend. New jobs will indeed fuel economic growth. Across all streams, the healthcare ecosystem is playing an increasingly important role in inclusive economic growth and therefore economic recovery from the pandemic and indeed sustainable development. Secondly, let me speak to the issue of health information systems. The most important thing that healthcare stakeholders can do in this situation is share information. We must collaborate, be transparent and aligned in the way that we manage knowledge, process information and analyze data to ensure that all partners are streamlined and get the best outcomes. There must be an emphasis on data-driven decision-making and evidence-based policy implementation. Strengthening health information systems through all modalities, including routine health information systems, epidemic intelligence, community data, as well as facility data, is key to better data leading to better decisions. Then it's the WHO recently released the Score for Health data package, which presents for the first time, all the key elements of a strong health information system 
to help countries meet the challenges of data availability, collection, analysis, dissemination, and use. This unique report represents 133 countries worldwide, the equivalent of 87% of the world's population. It can serve as a basis for an investment framework by guiding strategic investment towards needs priority interventions that have the most impact on the ground by specifically identifying areas of weakness in health information systems so that ministries of finance and donors can invest according to need. And let me close by giving you a few, recommend a few recommendations from this score report. The first recommendation is the need to strengthen death registration and certification of cause of death using either ICD-10 or ICD-11. The, the report highlighted that 40% of deaths globally are unreported. So that's, that really gives us some red light when we speak about COVID-19 reporting, and COVID-19 deaths specifically on the continent. Secondly, the report recommended to improve health data disaggregation, to identify health gaps amongst underprivileged groups and address inequalities. And this is increasingly important indeed as we aim to roll out the COVID vaccines. The third recommendation was to guide investments across all major health programs to strengthen the overall health data ecosystem rather than just focusing on specific programs. And finally, there's a need to strengthen data governance regulations to improve data access and sharing and to translate data into policies. I'll stop there and hand it back to you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amwenya. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I think he, the the investments and the triple de and dividends that you highlighted um, are extremely uh, not noteworthy. Um, Christian, let me let me come to you. Um, uh, uh, you know, you have you have uh, you know been you are on the front line and um, not just front line clinically, but also front line you know, from the research angle and the, and the public health angle. Um, how have you, you know, uh, uh, um, seen the way um, the response has, has played out and some of the lessons that, you know, you've been able to, you know, start putting together um, regarding this um, pandemic? And, and um, Dr. Kasonde talked about what it was before um, in order to prepare for what, what is, you know, to come. So what is your vantage point? Uh, thank you for, for that question, Dennis. And uh, a lot has been said that I obviously agree with 100%. Pandemics are going to occur more frequently, uh, just given the demographic and climate changes that are occurring uh, during our times. And as an intensive care doctor, I like to use this analogy. Uh, pandemics are sort of a stress test uh, for the society. And a stress test, you know, uh, for those who are not clinicians, you know, is where you, you know, put the body through a stress. And most often it's in cardiology to figure out if someone has, you know, previously undiagnosed or heart disease. And that's exactly what pandemics do. And that's what they did for the world at large. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we are lucky that, uh, you know, like the adage goes, it's better to be lucky than good that Africa seems to have dodged the worst as we expected, but it's not over yet. And if you look at the world and you, know, you analyze different parts of the world, you can sense that the response to the pandemic uh, depended on the strengths of different aspects of the public health system uh, or the scientific system. So if you look at countries that did very well in terms of prevention, uh, you see that their public health infrastructure was very solid. Uh, look at China, where the virus originated. Uh, they were very good at deploying uh, a robust public health response that mitigated the catastrophic rise in number of cases that we expected, just given the sheer size of their population. Uh, but then if you come to the Western countries, the United States, for example, you see that at the level of the front lines where I worked in the intensive care unit, we were able to go very far and deliver very good care uh, to a high number of critically ill patients. Uh, you also saw on the research and development front that you know, technology with the deployment of mRNA uh, vac vaccine technology being able to uh, transfect uh, well-coated mRNAs into cells, which is a breakthrough of on parallel proportions in terms of modern scientific discovery. We, we will look back at, at this and be in awe at what this uh, discovery was. And this happened in record time where within a year, uh, we're able to have uh, shot on people's arms, vaccinating people with mRNA vaccines. And so from that scientific perspective, you can see this disparate response where on the one hand, the United States probably did not 
have the kind of strong, robust response that a country like China did from the public health perspective. But then from the scientific breakthrough, uh, America was at the forefront, uh, the, the cutting edge of that. But if, if you go back to Africa, uh, you know, all the points have, uh, have been raised about, you know, our need to be prepared on the, uh, on the, on the, on the front lines, uh, up front, instead of waiting uh, to be caught flat footed. Uh, there are aspects uh, that are unique to Africa, and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk about that. Obviously, that's not my strength. Uh, but from the outside, looking at our systems, uh, you can just imagine that uh, if we have to prepare for a pandemic going forward, we certainly cannot rely uh, on having to stretch uh, an open hand uh, to beg for resources. Uh, because as we've all seen, this pandemic led to a lot of disruptions uh, in many things, including supply chain. So yes, so the rest of the world might have been willing to help, but the supply chain disruptions uh, led to uh, situations where those resources were not available in time to save a lot of uh, uh, African countries. Had we gotten to that uh, yet scenario? So my perspective is that you know uh, we have to think of this uh, as others have done. The playbooks are available for us to to to, to, to just deploy where we anticipate you know what future pandemics are going to do to an honorable, an already vulnerable healthcare system and how that reflects uh, the nature of our demographics, uh, the point in our economic uh, and sociopolitical growth and uh, how that uh, reflects to our long-term uh, strategic uh, views uh, of the world. I'll stop there. Well, thanks, Christian. I, and, and I think you are on the money regarding the, 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 the speed at which this breakthrough, you know, um, happened and the, the, the speed at which, you know, the war, um, the, the scientific community was able to um, develop an, um, not just one, but multiple um, effective um, vaccines um, for this. Now, um, Dr. Gorbinum. Um, on, on, on the ground, um, uh, you know, in Cameroon, where you, where, where you are, um, what is your global view? And, and also, if you were to expand a little bit uh, in, in your comments, how have you seen um, uh, the response, not just by ministries of public health, but also um, the, the uh, Africa CDC, which was you know, created just um, as an, uh, 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 after the Ebola pandemic, the, the Ebola epidemic? Thank you, Dennis, and thank you for having me on this um, important webinar. Um, uh, COVID-19 took everybody by surprise and um, nobody can claim to be so much further ahead in terms of knowledge, in terms of skill of managing something which is new to everybody. So uh, we're getting judged as we go. Um, but when I take from the very topic of our webinar, I find it very interesting that we're talking about lessons from COVID to Africa. And when we talk of lessons, we automatically raise the question of who is teaching and who is learning. And we're designating by our topic that the teacher is COVID. And how good has COVID been as a teacher? What skill? And we can say, or my judgment is COVID is a pretty good teacher. He has taught lessons systematically for a very long time in very, very strong terms. I mean, if anybody wants to ignore the reality of what this pandemic is, they need to just look at what is happening in the neighbor's house. Everybody possibly has been affected in one way or another by COVID and it has touched the great, it has touched the small, it has touched the developed, the under nobody is, is spared. We have a good teacher. But when we look at who is learning, we have a lot of considerations to, to make. As individuals, yeah, we're all learning new things. The average person in Africa and elsewhere knows a little bit more about health than they did before the COVID pandemic, because a lot is going out in terms of messages. But when we talk about COVID itself, about a pandemic and infectious um, disease, propagating around the world like this. We think that the, 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 those who are learning are governments, are the politicians, are the scientists, the NGOs, everybody's learning. And I, my impression is that the politicians go to a very different school from everybody else. 
And because we can see by the outputs, one year into COVID, and probably the most um, the most prolific head, headline in Cameroon is about fund mismanagement of funds. That is not what we should be talking about. If we are learning anything, and we were maybe fortunate to be to not be the first to be touched in the world. COVID touched other continents other than Africa. So we saw it coming and we've had time. And it, it also makes me want to say that we, through this pandemic, we realized that we draw conclusions a little bit too fast. It's my theory that if we did not have a second wave, social media platforms will be saturated by Africa taunting the rest of the world and saying, you guys may have all the money, but we are better doctors. We have better healthcare systems. You know, we said we'll be decimated. We are not. And that could have had more credit during the first wave. We didn't have much in terms of cases, in terms of deaths. The second wave is another story. And the second wave is telling us for real, if we didn't go too fast in making judgments about our ginger concoctions and uh, you know, all the panaxia which has been in the media for so long. In 2020, they sounded like they were the solution. And there was, there were, you know, resistant fronts where we're challenging the, the Western world. Why do you refuse our solution when we have solutions? In the second wave, we don't see those claims as heavy as before. It's like maybe they were working last year and they are not working now, or we judged, judged too fast. So my global view is that Africa may not really be learning or will learn the wrong things or we're all learning, but those who should learn and then take action are a little bit behind in class and we may need to reorganize our classrooms. Um, I think that Africa has organized itself somehow. The African CDC has taken up um, a lot of good work, a lot of good action. Through our discussions today, I'm sure we'll analyze um, a few of those things. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Ronald. And, and I, I mean, there, there is that view, obviously, of, of, of that reality, especially the second wave, you know, uh, um, hitting many African countries and also the fact that um, uh, there, is, uh, there seems to be, there is generally COVID fatigue, but there seems to be um, uh, uh, nihilistic views regarding COVID in many African you know, uh, uh, countries. Um, uh, Yele, let me, let me uh, um, uh, Christian had touched on some issues regarding um, uh, supply chain disruptions um, and, and how um, uh, there is now uh, the vaccine uh, uh, available and there is uh, vaccine nationalism. Um, it, it, we were all in this boat together, but vaccines are available and now, um, you know, for various reasons, you know, countries, you know, want to, the haves want to be able to um, vaccinate their populations first before um, others. Um, and Dr. Governor mentioned the, the fact that he doesn't think that many uh, politicians in Africa are learning uh, when you look at, you know, the, the, the facilities to be able to produce a, a, a manufacturing in Africa is very is very weak, so they can't um, even produce even if they wanted to. But uh, at least we know that um, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, South Africa, uh, um, I don't know if the Johnson and Johnson or the AstraZeneca vaccines, um, South Africa um, is looking to produce some of that. So regarding the 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 supply the supply chain supply uh, uh, wall supply chains. Um, uh, one thing we know is that COVID disrupted this. Um, for for countries um, preparing, you know, for the next pandemic uh, with uh, potentially similar disruptions, um, uh, what is your view as to you know what they have to do? Not just to build their health systems, yes, which needs to happen, and there are many things that have been alluded to, but also some ways of ensuring that certain diagnostics and, and therapeutics, you know, can can be manufactured. Um, how how does that? Uh, how do we go from here, and what can be done on that? Excellent question. Before I answer that, I just want to comment on something Dr. Gobina mentioned about politicians. Uh, it, is, it is clear 
that even in countries where you have, so to speak, mature democracies, in countries where you have the most sophisticated health systems and public health infrastructure, the misalignment of political leadership with public health and health system leadership creates problems. Leadership does matter and alignment in leadership along this value chain from governance politics to professionals and experts. This is a global reality because we saw what happened in different countries in Europe and in particular, we saw what has happened in the United States. It's a global reality and it is also evident in the countries in Africa. Political leadership matters and unison with the health industries, public health industry is critical to maximize opportunities during a pandemic. Now the issue of supply chain, the global supply chain was devastated with this pandemic. One of the reasons why that happened is because the world has been reliant on China for a largest proportion of the global supply chain. When it came to um, PPE, diagnostic reagents, and so on and so forth, there was a complete shutdown and a paralysis of the global supply chain. Some of the conversations that I am involved in in the work I do is many industries now looking to refocus their interests in developing relationships that are not dependent on one source. Um, industries are looking to places like Mexico, other countries in South America to evolve mature supply chains, not just in healthcare, but in several industries. But the supply chain business requires deep strategic intent and execution. But one of the lessons learned here is that the reliance on one country for supply chain can be dangerous. You speak about developing um, drugs, diagnostics on the continent. Uh, I believe that depending on the country and the in-country barriers to entry for entrepreneurial activity, it is possible. And that those conversations are already beginning. There's some countries that are very difficult to deliver sustained long-term business strategies. When I say long-term, 20 years, investing money in infrastructure to build laboratories, to do research and development, perfect process, cannot be dependent on the cycles of political leadership. So there, there are some countries in Africa that may emerge as best in class practices that will serve the continent, first their country and then the continent after all is said and done. And those conversations are happening, but developing a supply chain for even a country let alone a country, continent or globally, is a long-term investment. It requires strategy, vision, competencies, execution, and accountability. Hopefully, 10 years from now, we will begin to see this emerge on the continent in Africa. And you speak about vaccinations. I just want us to talk about the issue of herd immunity. Now we've gone through, you know, in the Western world, the United States in particular, the different phases of this pandemic from the surprise, massive numbers of infections, hospitalizations, deaths. You've seen the disparities in deaths in the United States of black and brown people. We've gone through the understanding of how to diagnose how to prevent personal social discipline, societal discipline, 
gone through the testing process, what type of test, how much does the test cost, how frequently should people be tested through the quarantine, the isolation, the vaccines are here now. And the goal is herd immunity. We can look at herd immunity from the perspective of a continent like North America, or from a country like the United States of America, or a continent like Africa. The point here is that when we're dealing with a pandemic, as we all know, if one continent or one country, United States of America, gets to herd immunity, Israel has announced that they think they're very close to herd immunity. Absent of delivering access to vaccinations to all countries in a very deliberate manner, then we are still at risk in the world. The variants are exploding. There are more variants that people know about in the media. Variant mutations is just a normal function of viruses. The millions of variants that occur, but every now and again, you have those variants that pop out that distinguish themselves mm -hmm. by way of being more transmissible or more lethal. Strategies for herd immunity cannot occur in the absence of delivering herd immunity outside the Western world. Mm -hmm. And that is also a function of supply chain. Mm -hmm. Supply chain done in a more innovative manner. These vaccines are expensive. So the United States government is subsidizing it for people in the United States. The limitations we're going to have on the continent are clear. First of all, the logistics of the cold chain supply chain, which is going to exclude the messenger RNA vaccines that have the highest levels of efficiency. Yeah. But of course, we can customize the other vaccines for utilization. Mm -hmm. But who pays for it mm -hmm. and how quickly Will it be rolled out across the continent is the question. Yeah. Well, um, Yele, I appreciate um, uh, uh, your comments there, especially the political leadership, um, you know, having to, you know, needing to be real aligned with, you know, the um, medical recommendations and the diversification of supply chain. Now, um, Christian, knowing that you, you, You'll be stepping out soon. Let me let me come to you. Um, you know, to 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 carry on from the the issue of vaccine, um, and 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 um, the issue of uh, a lot of vaccine hesitancy. It, it would appear um, uh, not just here, not just uh, um, in the Western world. Um, uh, uh, a lot in in um, in in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in Cameroon, um, they, I think they just received their first dose of 200,000 vaccine um, yesterday, and the, the Minister of Health, you know, um, the China the China vaccine, um, and the Minister of Health has rolled out the vaccination there, but obviously at a very, very timid pace. Um, so there is that issue of, of vaccination, uh, vaccinating the continent. The COVAX um, facility um, that that has been done uh, with um, CDC Africa CDC leadership, um, the the difficulty, as Yele said, of actually purchasing the the fact that you know, except from goodwill gestures from um, from friendly uh, advanced countries, a lot of these vaccines need to be um, purchased. Um, obviously, there are some African countries who want to buy and now have an opportunity or a, a platform to do that. But can you speak a little bit regarding, you know, uh, vaccination, the importance of that, the issues of uh, 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 vaccine um, hesitancy, and also uh, 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 a continuation of the, the, the illusion that Yele, Yele uh, mentioned of, you know, the infrastructure that is needed to deliver and things like this. No, uh, <laughs> not forgetting the, the fact of R&D, um, that, that is definitely um, a part of it. Well, absolutely. So, you know, vaccines or vaccination are, have been the biggest scientific, medical, medical scientific breakthrough of modern times. Uh, many of us would not be here today were it not for vaccines and vaccination. Uh, people have short memories, but if you go back in history and just 
look at what the world looked like a hundred thousand years ago, you would imagine that without vaccines, the world would look completely different. Now, vaccine hesitancy, which is born out of vaccine skepticism, uh, is not something new. Uh, we've been hearing stories, uh, there have been groups of anti-vaxxers in the fringe uh, elements of the internet for years, for decades. And I think that, you know, with the fear uh, that was born out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and uh, the uh, explosion uh, of dark elements of social media and the web, uh, that combination uh, just created the best recipe uh, for vaccine hesitancy uh, to blossom. And so, uh, it is easier to believe a conspiracy about a particular vaccine or what it does to the body than to take the time to reflect on uh, why the scientists have gone through uh, all the pains to create a vaccine uh, in the hopes of uh, putting this uh, virus at bay. And it is harder for the scientific community to convince uh, the population at large, especially when this uh, hesitancy has taken root. Uh, that the vaccine is safe uh, and effective, uh, especially when you have a disease like COVID-19. Now, you know, if you think about COVID-19, especially for younger people, uh, the mortality, the case fatality rate is quite low. And so in that context, people don't seem to uh, imagine that it is really a problem for them, uh, particularly. Uh, in the United States uh, and in most Western countries where uh, the older population is uh, mostly affected and we tend to offer uh, very expensive end-of-life care in the ICU, uh, we see that effect very uh, acutely and therefore uh, the acceptance of the vac vaccination becomes more, more, more relevant. I think that uh, even with the availability of vaccines and vaccination programs uh, across Africa with more supply, it is still going to be uh, an arduous task for our healthcare systems uh, to convince uh, people to uh, actually take the vaccine. I've been following news from Cameroon, which is where I'm from originally, and you can tell that the government uh, with all its good intentions struggled with the messaging of how to convince people to actually take the vaccine. Uh, you know, they, uh, one minute it was compulsory, it was mandatory, the next minute it wasn't. So it was very, you know, I could see their, their struggle in terms of encouraging people to take the vaccine. Uh, but, you know, if you talk about, you know, the availability and the supply, well, it's natural that, you know, if the United States develops their vaccines and with the, you know, the, the prevalence of severe disease in, in the country, that they would prioritize their population. And when they are satisfied with that, then they will look at helping other people. I agree with Dr. Aluko that, you know, without, you know, helping other countries that this is a pandemic and those variants are going to get here if we only focus on uh, populations within the United States or within North America or the Western world. Uh, however, it is also incumbent on the leadership uh, of uh, African countries uh, to step up and be part of the discussion, uh, not only in terms of always uh, you know, begging for help, but also offering uh, the resources that we have. We have a young, dynamic, uh, intelligent population that just needs to be guided to do the right thing. If you look at this panel and if you look at similar panels uh, across the world, there are scientists from Africa that are doing wonderful work as part of the global effort. We just have not figured out a way to harness that uh, to go back to our uh, continent and offer the expertise that we have learned across the world in order to do uh, the good work that is needed to uh, get our populations to be prepared uh, for the next pandemic that is uh, obviously inevitable. Uh, just as you know, um, as we transition, um, uh, uh, Christian, as I understand the time challenge, but um, let's let's look quickly as we as we, we start looking to wrap up. Um, what are your key recommendations, Christian? You know, um, as 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 what what are some of these lessons? I know uh, uh, Ronald talked about you know COVID um, being a very good teacher. You know, for you, what are the lessons that you are, 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 are uh, you know? Are coming to conclusion on uh, regarding COVID and and some of the recommendations that you know you would you would want um, for 
for the continent as a whole? So the first thing is, you know, we have to change our paradigm. Uh, the notion that we will always be uh, at the bottom of uh, uh, the ladder uh, should actually stop. We are capable, we are intelligent, we are hardworking people, and we uh, are proud people, and we should behave accordingly. What does that mean? That means joining the entire world of, uh, you know, of science and, 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 and development to be proactive. Uh, we have a young population compared to the rest of the world. We are, have the youngest population. And there is hope that uh, as we look forward that Africa would emerge as the future uh, of uh, the next world. But to do that, we need leadership. Uh, I am not a politician. I'm just a, a doctor, an intensive care doctor for that matter, which means that my daily life is very focused in a very narrow space. Uh, but I do occasionally look out uh, the window and see what the world looks like. And what I see is a lot of bright minds uh, in Africa. You see, you know, every once in a while on the web, you see some young African kid uh, doing some phenomenal work, trying to build a ventilator, trying to build an airplane, trying to build a drone. So we have the little nuggets to be able to start building something substantive. Uh, but to do that, uh, we need leadership. And I do not know how to fix it. Uh, Dr. Govina mentioned something, you know, you know, we just hope to be lucky, but that's not enough. You know, when a problem arises, our leaders, us, the experts, we need to get together and accept the reality and prepare accordingly. What we have done is to create a void that has now been taken over by social media and where anybody can sit, uh, you know, in their room and just imagine something, type it out on a social media platform and blast it out. And people just eat that up and that becomes the narrative. And so why does this happen? It's because the leaders have created a void that is now exploited uh, by people who uh, are seeking to undermine uh, those institutions. And, you know, I know this is not a specific answer, but such a big problem cannot be answered with specifics. We need to look globally uh, at, at what are those things in general that are holding us back uh, in, 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 in many other aspects, not just the pandemic. The pandemic is a whole problem, but it's also a socioeconomic problem. It's, you know, it's a political problem. So it is much more complicated uh, than just looking at it from a med medical standpoint. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, Ronald, I'll come to you then, um, Wenja, regarding you know some of your your um, uh, recommendations as to you know what we are you guys are learning. Um, you know, uh, uh, Governor uh, Ronald, you talked about COVID having been been a great teacher. I, you know, I know you as a very good uh, student, <laughs> so so uh, I am very interested in in knowing what you have learned um, and what uh, you think that. You know some of the politicians who you think are learning they're not listening well what should they be uh, be learning from this um I, I think for one we cannot learn everything in a day and but some things are clear the nature of the pandemic we're facing is we're dealing with an infectious disease so if i were to do a, a judgment on my nation or the continent or the world one year after I'll be asking how better are we in anticipating and managing not every kind of health disaster, no infectious disease outbreak. Meaning if there's one thing that should have changed if we are learning is that our capacity should have increased in diagnosing, in managing. I think it's in Ghana where within last year, they already set up an infectious disease institute. That's what I want to see in African countries. We have been hit hard enough to know that we don't need another pandemic to take us to the ground before we try to wake up. Where are the experts? We don't need to import experts. Are we training those who are here? Are we learning better governance, management skills, deployment of resources to manage a pandemic of this type? So if I were to, I think the, the lessons are there. We're just not putting application to them. I would love to see, um, I know a national committee was created that advises the minister on everything COVID related. 
but it may just end as a political meeting of people who write papers and send to the minister. Where are the research institutions? Are we better at research? The technology to produce oxygen in sufficient countries for all the hospitals in Cameroon, sufficient quantities is not rocket science. Why should we depend on oxygen bottles being filled in Yaoundé and Douala? So we're not learning because I'm, I will not, I can't say we're learning because I can't see changes in those lines on practical issues concerning the management of an infectious disease outbreak. I want to see um, uh, a residency program opening in a faculty of medicine for infectious diseases. We still do not have one, but we've had enough time. We have enough experts to open one and start training infectious disease experts on our soil. So to me, those would be indicators that we're learning and that we are changing. Thank you. Those are things that you want to see, and I and and it, it seems to really flow back into um, Christian's you know comment about um, leadership. There is there has to be paradigm and change, and we need leadership. And and a lot of these things are um, uh, leadership issues. Now, um, when you let me come to you before um, I, I I return to uh, uh, Yelem, um, you you what are you know from from your 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 overview and and your initial uh, 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 deep comments. On this, what are you know, uh, uh, Dr. Gobina is not seeing a lot of learning, even though he, he, he thinks that the, the, the lessons are there to take. Um, are you seeing? Uh, are you seeing some positives out there? Thanks, Dennis. I'm, I'm conscious of time, so I won't. I'll keep my uh, my intervention um, relatively short. So a couple of things. If I can just quickly speak on the issue of access to COVID tools. Um, we've spoken about vaccines, we've spoken about diagnostics, and indeed the WHO, amongst, along with other global health partners, recently launched what they call the ACT-A Accelerated Initiative, Act, Act Standing for Access to COVID Tools, and that has three pillars, namely diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. And just to put things into perspective slightly, indeed we are slightly behind in Africa, we all know this, but maybe I can give you some, some numbers just to illustrate the gap that exists between the South and the North currently. As you mentioned in my new introduction, I'm originally from Zambia, but I am currently floating somewhere between Geneva, the UK and Lusaka. And just to give you again a, a, a bit of perspective, in Zambia we've had so far roughly 90,000 cases of COVID-19 um, since the beginning of the pandemic now, just over a year ago. And we've undertaken 1,300,000 tests of COVID, COVID tests in the last uh, roughly year or so. Then it's in the UK, 1,200,000 tests get undertake, are undertaken every single week. So that's an amazing, amazing disparity. If you can just see how large the gap is between indeed the global south and the global north. And you may argue that the populations of Zambia are slightly different and the UK, about 60 million people in the UK and roughly 20 million in Zambia. But nonetheless, that doesn't quite explain the disparity of a million tests in a year as opposed to a million tests every week. When it comes to the area of vaccinations, again, we are aware of our situation. 16 million vaccines have been delivered to 31 countries on the continent so far. When we compare that to 31 million vaccines in the UK alone, we, we can really see the disparities that exist. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, COVID-19 has been a great opportunity for us in terms of specific dig digital health innovations, such as the platform that you all gathered upon today. And we spoke today about political leadership as well. And let me give you the specific example of the government of Rwanda that has invested in heavily in their broadband infrastructure so that now approximately 90% of the country is covered with a mobile phone penetration of roughly 75% of the population. Mm -hmm. So again, great opportunities are existing within this unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic, specifically in the areas of digital health and, and health information systems as previously mentioned. Mm -hmm. Again, in Rwanda, the digital primary healthcare service has been launched now for the first time. And this means that everybody in the country over the age of 12 will have access to consultations to, to doctors and nurses from their mobile phones. So really some fantastic innovations that are taking place across the, con the continent. There are so many that I won't be able to, to list them all today. We recognize our downfalls, but nonetheless, I think it's important once in a while to celebrate our wins. Thanks, Dennis. 
Thank you very much for that. And I, I, I think uh, you, uh, you've highlighted uh, great points there for, for us. Now, Yele, let me come to you um, uh, as, we, as, we, as we wrap up. And I know that there have been some questions. Um, we have two minutes, but uh, let me, let me uh, spotlight some questions and then um, have you give, give um, some of your, your, uh, your clothes, um, Yele. Um, there, there's a question, how much does a, 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 a COVID vaccine cost? You know, um, I think that, you know, it, it varies um, per country um, uh, uh, for that. Um, now, um, Yele, as, as you know, there are the supply chains, long-term invest, investing, political leadership um, needing to be aligned, um, the need for um, paradigm shift in, in thinking, the, the need for, as Dr. Governor says, some kind of in institutes, you know, in the specific issue of infectious diseases, you know, if we had learned something from what Dr. Governor is saying, there should be some palpable changes on the ground. And I know in Nigeria, at least, uh, certain institutes for detection or so um, have been much more effective, like the Nigeria CDC or, or something. Now, globally, um, what have you? What are you learning? Um, and and what is it that you you would want you know to see differently? So globally, um, what we are seeing is differential capabilities of response, which are based on infrastructural um, preparedness, political alignment and economic power. So in the United States, the vaccination rollout is now efficient. The goal is herd immunity. So that, that convergence of those competencies of, of leadership, infrastructural sophistication, and strategy are critical. If they're lined up, then you have best outcomes. If they're not, then you don't which goes back to the fundamental question that you're asking, what have we learned? Now, we probably learned that the predictability models that suggested Africa would be decimated by COVID-19 were wrong. But the larger question is that if Africa has staved off the brunt of COVID-19, is it because of preparedness or simply sheer fortuity? And the fortuity has occurred, I believe it's fortuity, but it has occurred because of a convergence of several things. One is the, the, the young age, 60% of Afri the African population is under the age of 25. Communal living, maybe cross reactivity of, um, that has resulted in higher levels of antibody presence in general due to multiple infectious diseases. Whatever it is, it is not because of systematic preparedness. Therefore, again, you peel the onion. The question is how will the continent fare when the next global biological, chemical, natural economic disaster comes? The lessons that we have learned, we should learn, is that we re really need to understand the role of government here in an accountable manner. Now, in the developing world, governments have different levels of GDP. But fundamentally, the inability to follow up with alignment around the Abuja Declaration, for example, where countries have committed to, to, to allocate a certain percent of GDP towards health, those type of issues are reflections of the maturity or immaturity of governments. Mm -hmm. We know that government cannot take care of the entire country. No government can. So therefore, what other lesson have we learned is what is the role of private businesses, corporations that can help to synergize with government long-term value for society? Mm -hmm. And there was a mention of the digital world. Um, if Africa, is not prepared to participate in the digital revolution, we will be left behind. We are already behind. Mm -hmm. And as innovation is occurring in the digital world, the distance between us and the rest of the world will just be exponentially, ultimately, infinitely far. Mm -hmm. It has been said that for decades, nothing happened in telemedicine. Mm -hmm. And in three weeks, in the pandemic, decades happen. Mm -hmm. 
So within three weeks, billions of telemedicine um, interactions were occurring. Whereas for decades prior to that, very little was happening. So the ability to pivot with innovation when it is needed requires certain elements to be in place, most critical of which is leadership. Totally agree with you, Yele. Now I would uh, I will push you on one one thing. We know after the Ebola, um, uh, one of the out, outcomes of the Ebola epidemic was the creation of the Africa CDC. Now that was a very specific thing, and 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 uh, given its even its uh, with its limitations, the Africa CDC, you know, for my own rating, has done a phenomenal job. Um, uh, what are you? Uh, do, do you think there should be? something similar to this to the cdc coming you know after the pandemic after uh, uh, this pandemic or um, strengthening the cdc or in, in anything continental wide to be able to, uh, 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 to to help guide some of these responses i mean the, the cdc is africa cdc is there but uh, you should never waste a good a, a, a good uh, what's the, the the statement never waste a a, a, a good um, a problem or a good a good crisis. A good crisis should never should never be left to waste. So uh, I know a lot of African uh, governments have used the crisis to 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 grab more power. But you know, <laughs> if if you were to use the crisis in a very good way, um, the Africa CDC creation of the Africa CDC after the pan, uh, Ebola uh, epidemic was one. Um, and you know, I'm just you know picking your brain, what else? Is there something else that could be done, you know, continental wise or, or even not? No, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. The Africa CDC has done a great job. The Africa CDC has been a very strong leader, uh, an advocate, a convener, an influencer. But more needs to be done through the Africa CDC. As we well know, the World Health Organization does similar work across the world. And it is difficult to get alignment across multiple jurisdictions and geographies. But the Africa CDC has done a yeoman's job. I have followed the, the, the comments and the, 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 the CDC director, uh, Dr. Nkenga Song. I'm very impressed with his leadership. So it takes leadership takes leadership, strong leadership, and around a strong leader, strong followership. That's what we are seeing in the CDC in Africa. The CDC Africa is not empowered locally, but it is now in a position to create the liaisons across all African countries to be aligned around the imperative of best practice. So it is a great step in the in the right direction that will only get better thank you very much um rona let me come to you uh, for for your some some concluding remarks from you um you know i i i, I we're learning a lot um, what else is out there uh, what do you think i think it's not over as i said covid came as a surprise to everybody we're learning as we go along um to Yale really pointed it out Christian pointed it out, we have to consider that government cannot do it all. So even if our government are not in very good books, we need to see how the civil society organizations, the businesses, other actors join forces to make certain things work. We need to see partnerships that make things work, but we need to have clear objectives um, Clear, really clear objectives. If this was an environmental catastrophe occurring around the world, oh yeah, then we're going to have objectives in that direction. We need to make sure the next virus that comes into the public space does not ravage us this much. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that will be the case if it comes now and meets the status quo. We need some concrete things happening with specific objectives. We do have the expertise. And maybe we're learning that we shouldn't wait for central governments to, to really push this. Mm -hmm. And we need to be talking like this. We need to brainstorm with other partners and get things, get things working. 
Thank you very much. Yele, Amwenya, uh, Ronald, Christian, thank you all very much for this uh, very important uh, conversation, which has been very riveting. Um, I uh, much appreciate your, 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 your comments and your insights on this. Um, these conversations um, continue, um, and I hope you all will be able to uh, respond positively when we invite you for uh, further um, insights from you. Uh, very much appreciate this and wish you all a very good day um, in your different uh, in different areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. Have a good one.